This exhibition has been a journey for Ayana and myself. Her work is glorious. Ayana is known as a photographer, and this is a moment where you're seeing an artist push into all these new media and the talent of being able to take on sculptural installation, animation, and immersive video all in one exhibition is truly mind-blowing. We live in a society right now that's really emphasizing the divisions and not recognizing that divine force that is in our world. And she brings this incredibly feminist, sacred reality into bearing here. And the way that you can experience it is through the series of encounters. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to exhibit at this level and to share this story because it's not a small thing. This was a holocaust, the transatlantic slave trade. This is millions of people who died in the ocean, didn't even make it. So from a site of annihilation to a realm of possibility. Good afternoon, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? We can, we can do better than that, we can do better than that, yes, yes. We'd like to welcome you to this, the 39th edition of the Adar Salon. This is our season finale uh, for uh, the Salon. Uh, and we are thrilled to have with us Ayana V. Jackson, the acclaimed, amazing, world-renowned uh, visual artist. Y'all make some noise for Ayana. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Yes. Uh, and just a few words about Adama. Adama is the African Diaspora Art Museum of Atlanta. Uh, we were founded in 2018 with a mission to uh, activate a voice to 21st century African diaspora through art and culture. Um, we're thrilled to be here now in Pittsburgh Yards. Uh, we have our first uh, in-person exhibition, We Need Love, which you guys can check out after the talk today. Uh, and we'll be continuing to do uh, programming and engagements here at Pittsburgh Yards uh, for the foreseeable future. And so we're really thrilled to be here. But let's jump into this conversation. And just as we get started, this thing jumps to an ad. It would not mind to tap on that <laughs> iPad thing there just to kind of uh, get us re going again. Um, but uh, yeah, Ay Ayana has. Um, uh, a, a practice that spans uh, the African diaspora, um, but is very, very firmly rooted right here in Atlanta, right? Um, and uh, I think it's really uh, interesting that your your journey began not necessarily as an artist, uh, but as a sociologist, right? Um, and you uh, uh, graduated from Spelman. I'd like for you to maybe talk a little bit about how you arrived at your uh, practice from, you know, the or do you want me to talk about how I used to see you on Spelman's campus to in your studio? <laughs> <laughs> we, we could do a little bit of both ends. How about that? Um, yeah. So um, we our relationship began when you your student was basically um, painting uh, with Arturo Lindsay under Arturo Lindsay um, on Spelman's campus um, in the art department. And uh, but at that time, yes, I was studying sociology. Um, I was interested in the social sciences um, from from years back, um, and you know, Dr. Cole would it, part of how I got soci sociology as opposed to political science was when Dr. Janetta V. Cole uh, was our president, and I think I'm not sure it was under her or it came prior, but we all had to take two semesters of African diaspora in the world. So that's when I first started reading like Amy Cesar, Sangor. Um, du Bois, of course, you know, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, and 
uh, Fire magazine and all of these kinds of like, so that so Spellman set the stage um, for me to begin to interrogate certain narratives to expand the map of blackness. I think that luckily, you know, I come from Garvey type, you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather um, sat at, you know, was able to interact with uh, Marcus Garvey. My grandfather remembers seeing his father um, interact with Marcus Garvey. And then my grandfather eventually created, had land in Ghana. So I had a reason to think about Africa, but it wasn't until I got to Spelman that I started to expand into diaspora. So we're talking about South America, we're talking about the Caribbean, Martinique, and and then also like the ways that um, our struggles were, were 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 happening in tandem, right? The the Black Arts Festival in in the first Black Arts Festival in Senegal, you had Black Americans coming to Senegal, right? And then, so I I, I guess that made me choose social science and sociology. Yeah, uh, I think I think it's really interesting too to to, to think about um, uh, the the connection the the thread between sociology and art. You know. Uh, the practice of I, um, you know, one of the things that I often, uh, a quote that I often refer to is like, in the future, historians will tell what happened, but artists will tell how it felt, right? And so when we think about uh, the practice of sociology, um, you know, I think a lot of times artists are that by default, right? Like, um, and I know that while you didn't study art necessarily, uh, you've you've been familiar with photography as a practice, right? Um, from a very early age. So can you talk about how you were able to um, uh, bring that, that, uh, that skill set, that, that discipline, that practice into your work, you know, um, sociology? Yeah, um, thankfully um, I'm Spelman class of 99. So there are no records of my thesis. <laughs> <laughs> It's still on a hard disk somewhere, <laughs> or maybe a floppy. I don't know, but <laughs> I didn't do exactly the best on it. I mean, so my point is this, that um, so I studied uh, sociology, and then my minor was in Spanish, right? Um, I studied abroad in the Dominican Republic and Argentina, and I mentioned that because my project at the time was to look at race relations, how race relations, so it's a, it's a naive thesis, but I was 21, right? Um, you know how race relations is different from looking at euro euro centered like the southern cone like argentina chile um you know because of course you had black communities in in argentina um and then versus like the caribbean afro-caribbean so how are people dealing with blackness in those two places and then also central and north america right and so what happened was um that in in doing that project um i you know, I did what I did. I, I, I was able to graduate with it, but it wasn't exciting. And I remember feeling like I, my, my writing wasn't strong enough. And I think that was, praise, at the time, that was the critique, that the writing, that the ideas were brilliant, but the writing wasn't strong enough. Um, and so I was kind of disappointed with that and maybe a little discouraged, but then, you know, I moved on. And one of the places I didn't get to, though, was Mexico. Um, and so... I, but I did find this little um, article in research that was written by Aguirre Beltran, who said, was talking about the Costa Chica on the border of Mexico, of um, Puerto, uh, Guerrero and Oaxaca, that there are black communities there. And I was like, oh man, you know, if I had another semester to study abroad, I would have gone there. So fast forward, um, I meet my former partner, uh, Marco Bobo, and we start chatting, it's like around 2001, 2002. We start chatting, I was like, did you know they're black Mexicans? And he was like, yeah, like, you know, and so we started to kind of think about it. And so we went to the Costa Chica. And I remember getting off the bus or, and, and then like, I felt like I saw my uncle Jay walk by. I was like, that's a whole black American. <laughs> like, like everything about, um, you know, all, from complexion to texture, hair texture, the swagger, it was just, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, and I didn't, I never thought about, so, so basically I decided to use my camera as my tool for communication at that point. And it was, uh, it was, that was when the 
the, the trip happened. So I'm able to satisfy my intellectual curiosity, my social scientist, my sociologist curiosity, but only using the camera. And that was the beginning. I think that's dope because, uh, you know, we, we, we are familiar with that, uh, that adage, like a, a, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? But we don't often think about the ways in which uh, artworks themselves become texts, right? Um, and this kind of, uh, you know, leads me to talk a little bit about your, uh, the, the exhibition that you now have. First of all, Ayana has a new exhibition at the Smithsonian Museum of African Art. Y'all make some noise for this. <laughs> this, is, this is not like small potatoes, right? Like this is a major uh, exhibition. Uh, it's called From the Deep uh, in the Wake of Drexia, uh, which is uh, based on a uh, story about the uh, uh, enslaved people who died in the Middle Passage, right? And so uh, in many ways, you're... Uh, you're reviving them. You're you're giving them life again, and I, I I think that there's one way that this story might have been told through the lens of of academics and historians, right? But then there's something else that happens altogether different when it's told through the lens of an artist. Can you talk a little bit about this project and how it came to be? Yeah. Um, well, um, my sister, my Spelman sister, my best friend um, Ingrid Lafleur. Um, is from Detroit. And she, uh, after we graduated, moved to New York and became close with Greg Tate, the late great Greg Tate, the GOAT. <laughs> um, may his soul rest in peace. Um, it really pains me that he's not here for this, but I mean, he's here, you know? Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, and so early conversations with Greg and Ingrid. It's weird because like, I can't decide who I heard the word Drexia from first, but because I think it was the two of them talking about, and this is before Afrofuturism was even a term. You know, I believe Greg was at the table on the dais with like some other people, um, Kojo Eshun and some others, when the word was first uttered and became the movement. But the thing is that movement has history, right? So talking about... Um, uh, science fiction, Octavia Butler, Samuel Delaney, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually um, Drexia comes up and it hit me like in the gut. Um, this idea that it never occurred to me what would happen if a person had been either kidnapped, pregnant, or raped in the dungeons or raped on the ship. Because they sex created us. So they threw away their own babies, basically. I feel like that needs to be said. But anyways... Um, you know, raped on the ship and then thrown overboard because they went into labor or that they knew the fate or they knew that they did not want to experience the fate when that ship docked. Mm -hmm. So they jumped, mm -hmm. right? And like, it was like, you know, and then it was like, how do I sit with the pain of that, right? right? And the deliverance that Drexia, the myth of Drexia offers is that somehow these babies were able to be born and that it, because they could breathe the embryonic fluid, mm -hmm. they could perhaps breathe the water. And at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, they're thriving, mm -hmm. right? And I was just like, this is it. So I'm quoted um, in this video as saying what Greg Tate said in an article, that Drexia took the middle passage from a realm, from a site of annih annihilation to the realm of possibility. Wow, I love that. I love that. I didn't say that. Great Tate said that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I love that. And uh, I, I would, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that the, the video stopped playing, but there's there's some really uh, powerful. Who has the iPad? It's right over here, but it's locked up. Um, yes, I can, I can, I'll get up and adjust it in just a second. But uh, the the, the thing that's really striking to me um, in the ways in which you are imagining uh, these beings, imagining these, 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 these lives, right? Is, is that it still is very uh, uh, married to um, uh, conventions and concepts and philosophies that we find on the continent, right? Like it's a very diasporic uh, interpretation. Like it's not limited to one particular uh, ethnic group or or region or, or or tribe, right? Like that, you're pulling from across the continent uh, to create the, uh, the the fashion, the 
the hairstyles, like even the movements of, of the figures. Can you talk a little bit about the research that went into creating this body of work? Yeah. Um, so again, I, I just have to go back to Greg Tate. Um, the conversation that we had um, State Park when I was working on this project, um, he said with humility, and so I don't want to say this, uh, I'm going to say it briefly, it deserves more unpacking, but I am saying it with humility that, you know, within, like, you can't, you kind of can't get more African than Black Americans because in our blood are several countries. So, like, my diet, my DNA says I'm 78% African. Um, some of that, it's like 70% uh, of that 78% is like Nigerian and then like, 5% from Gabon, Cameroon, and then like broadly West African. There were like six countries in my bloodline, right? So when you look at something like um, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever, there are communities that are frustrated by the, the kind of intermixing of like Kosa with Zulu, with like Fanti, with, you know, all this kind of West African and East African, but that's us. And one of the conversations that I had with, with Greg was about reality that like, a lot of us even when you think about Kwanzaa like we're trying to like pick up the pieces and gather the straws and put something together that kind of can't really be put back together you know and so with this project I was intentional in not being authentic in not being in not trying to cite tradition um, because also um, these are living traditions everywhere culture in general is a living thing Right. We can cite inflection points or markers or moments or deviations or but of, from one narrative where it splits into another. But at the end of the day, culture is always living. Right. So with this project, um, I uh, the, the, the late great Oakland Wizor, um, the first time he came to visit my studio in Paris, um, he was like, but what's your intervention? And I was like, I never, I was like, what do you mean? I didn't go to art school, so I didn't understand what it meant that like, you know, we all know that there's nothing new under the sun. Um, there are no art practices that don't have an antecedent. But like, so the question is, you take something that has already become fully formed and you want to refer to it and you want to expand on it. The question is, what's your intervention? So in this project, the intervention was something that troubled me as well back in the day. Also, there was another time that I sat down and talked with Arthur Jaffa and Ingrid um, at my house in Brooklyn and we were talking about, and I'm like, we were like, it was one of those nights, right? So we're like in the, in the cloud <laughs> and, um, <laughs> um, or some people were in the cloud. Anyways, um, <laughs> it doesn't agree with me, but, um, anyway, um, and then it was just like, but then how are these, I mean, did they just spontaneously eject? Like, how did the babies get born while their mothers were dead or dying? And it occurred to me um, when a few years later, Karen asked, uh, nominated me, Karen Milborn, the curator for this exhibition at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, which is the black, not the black Sony, oh God, I'm gonna get in trouble with Lonnie Bunch. <laughs> not the National Museum of African History and Culture, but the Museum of African Art, which was originally, um, fun fact, um, housed in the, ho the former home of, Frederick Douglass when it was birthed um, before it moved to the mall. Anyways, um, and nominated me for the Smithsonian African Research Fellowship. And at the time that, that happened, I immediately thought of Drexia and I thought of that question, how were these babies able to be born? And then I was like, right, what if the Mamiwatas that hail from the countries that these, maybe the Mamiwatas followed them on the journey and they were able to midwife these babies. So then that's how my intervention on the on the Drexia story. And I went to to meet Mad Mike. I went to uh, Underground Resistance. I met. Uh, I may or may not have met one of the members of Drexia. Um, and so, um, and I'll rest in peace, also James Stinson and Gerald Donald. Uh, the two of them, Drex, right? So I actually I asked. I, I did ask for permission to use their name. But the thing that in this exhibition that exists that did not exist as they were telling it initially was this idea of the mommy watches. So we work with Olukun. So I don't embody spirit spirit because I'm not initiated. Um, but, but because I think that we have to 
um, remember our mythologies or our traditions or our religions, whichever word feels appropriate, right? Um, so I'm thinking about, I want to go from the Yoruba swamp. So there are some Drexians that were midwifed by Yamaya. There are some that were midwifed by Olukun. There are some that were midwifed by Kianda that hails from Angola, you know, et cetera, right? So that's where... I forget the beginning of this question, but that's the intervention. Yeah, no, no, that's 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 actually absolutely uh, amazing, and, and uh, I, I, I'm compelled to ask: Are you familiar with the uh, a book? It's called Something Torn in. No. Uh, it's uh, um, by uh, a Kenyan philosopher, uh, Ngugi Wa Okay. Um, but he similarly um, he talks about this concept of remembering uh, the black body, right? Um, and thinking about the ways in which uh, I like that remembering mm -hmm, exactly oh. yeah uh so thinking about the ways in which the the black body conceptually even physically right you know uh spiritually linguistically and all these different ways has been dismembered you know from itself and so an attempt to uh reconstruct you know that body right like it becomes the 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 goal right like what does it mean to remember blackness and i love the way that you're thinking about it um which is a sort of like uh, I, I don't want to just say pan pan African, but pan diasporic, you know, uh, uh, practice. Um, there's something else I wanted to uh, also uh, ask you about. You you use your own body very often in your work. Can you talk a little bit about why why you position yourself in your work? So um, I've talked a lot about the first time I did it. It had to do with um, a residency in Paris and a, an evening that I had, um, you know, um, where I felt like I had gone into an, I went into an exhibition, um, and I was, I, I felt, I first felt completely invisible, um, in white face, and then eventually I became hyper visible. Um, and and then I was and then when I became hyper visible in that white space because um, I happened to be the friend of an artist, um, Fred Wilson. So um, who was the first I think Black American to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale? So here I am in Paris and I'm attending this exhibition and 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 you know he's like thanks for coming. I mean I. Um, because if it, if it weren't for you, I'd be the only black person here. And that was actually true at that moment. We were the only black people in that gallery at the time. Uh, and then, but then whenever I was standing next to him, I was invisible again. And then I was like, it's cool, I got you. And then I invited Lisa Tonga and a whole bunch of other friends. And then all of a sudden, it was like five black people. And it was like, that was only like a rush. It was a bum rush of black people, right? <laughs> and I don't know if it's true, because I really do think about perception and projection, you know, but I know I, my, what was happening internally for me was that suddenly it was like, oh, what's going on? Why are there so many black people here, right? And then he's like, you know, I love your friends. I'm so happy you did this. Like, it means a lot, but I'd like to invite you to the dinner and I can only invite one guest. I was like, no, it's cool. We've been in our world forever. Like, we, not everybody can go. So now I'm in the home, I believe, of either a patron or the gallerist and um, and now everyone wants to know who I am. And I was like, what in the world is this? And now they're talking about like where I went to college, who my parents are, like da 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 da. And I was like, I wish I could expand myself into like different, like multiple iconic black women throughout time. And we all walk in together, <laughs> we say hello, and then we can talk about the art like everybody else or cookies, mm -hmm. like, or the food. Mm -hmm. Like, why is this a, why is this an ethnographic right, research right, and right. I'm the subject? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It was wild. I was like, what is this? Like, what, no, you know, and, and it's fine. I understand curiosity. I understand that there are communities that have not had a chance to engage with mm -hmm. us properly. Um, and are excited about the opportunity, you know, so it's, it's no shade to that, but at the same time, it, comes, it can be uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. So that night, you know, I don't know how, I mean, I'm sure we all have our different practices, but for me, a lot of things happen in the dream state. So that's when I decided to do leapfrog. So also with another amazing artist, Pascal Abolo, we performed um, a project that had to do with harnessing power on the backs of black women um, as women. 
And so, um, I mean, a lot of people have harnessed power on the back of black women. <laughs> so not just, but in our case, we were thinking about that. So we looked at like um, tropes. Anyways, um, that was how it first happened. But then the way, the reason I kept with it is because the next project I did, Poverty Pornography and Archival Impulse, was dealing with some very difficult things. So everything from lynchings mm -hmm. to um, the way that uh, ethnographic photography in the 19th century, like the subtle violence and lack of, the subtle violence that happened on the black body in the first 50 years of photography, which was also happening at the, at the same time as the colonial experiment, mm -hmm. excuse me, which thankfully in about, we're coming up within the next couple of decades, Africa will have been out of colonization longer than it was ever in it. I feel like that's something we have to acknowledge. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, uh, so it will be passed. <laughs> it's going to take a little while for us to get past mm -hmm. the period of enslavement. But, I mean, colonization was like less than a century, mm -hmm. right? So um, South Africa, 94, right? So that's the last one, you know? So, um, but anyways, and it was only colonized for... Anyway, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, it's important to understand yeah. that, like, you know, we only need a century to get out of the... To, be, to, to have been out of it longer than we were in it and then to remember that there was a whole time before it and right. then it can just kind of like go away. Um, so I didn't want, to, I felt I was kind of having a conversation around um, how the black woman's body or how the black body or how the non-white body was sexualized, victimized, um, traumatized, um, the gluttony for images of those things um, and how photography was implicit in construction of racial identity. I could not ask another person to perform that. Mm -hmm. Definitely not another black woman. Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna engage with trauma, I'll absorb that trauma. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I kept working with my body. And then I realized I was traumatizing myself. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got out of it and that's how the Victorians are becoming subject okay. and then how we got here. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's important, you know, to that, that sort of embodiment actually also, uh, um, uh, carries you into the work in a kind of way that that doesn't allow even for your audience to distance themselves, right? Like there's a sort of intimacy that happens that I think uh, comes through in the work when you when you sort of subject yourself to those those ideas and things. Uh, is that something that you would say uh, was also informed by uh, by your your movement? Because uh, you know, right now you're you know, according to your bio, you're based in uh, New York, Paris, and South Africa, right? Like, so you're actually physically, you know, moving throughout the diaspora as well. It's not just a conceptual thing, but it's actually like a embodiment, you know. Uh, so, are, are you are you thinking that in 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 those ways in your movement, they are also informing your work? Well, there's two parts to two ways that I can answer that question. Um, I'll try both uh, on one hand there is if i lose my train of thought remind me mm -hmm. um because there is why i move in the work okay. and then there's the question i think you're asking which is um what it means to be to have one arm and two legs mm -hmm. on three continents mm -hmm. um so that for me is important because i've oh, my father uh was studying ethnomusicology he's an, he was an attorney when he when he passed away he was a musician um, but w I grew up listening to like Samba and learning about Samba's African roots, right? Mm -hmm. Congo and, you know, and, and, and Rumba mm -hmm. having roots in the Congo. Um, you know, um, Santa Fe mm -hmm. uh, incantations of spirit that also have roots in Yoruba, right? So as a child sitting at his knee, I was learning about, about these things but not as African, but as Caribbean and as South American and as Black American, right? So, um, and then because of our home in Ghana and our family that uh, adopt us, actually um, the Amegbo family who are Ewe, um, I was just kind of like um, always, I never centered Black American as the, the root African diaspora identity. I always felt like, with all respect to my own community, because we're up from slavery, it's like us and like the Mayflower. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I don't have like in my family, as far as I know, there's one missing link. But as far as I know, we're all up from slavery. Like we didn't, we nothing wrong with it, but we didn't mix, mm -hmm. right? So you know, I get it. Like I'm into being Black American, Black U.S. American, and what it means to live in this culture. But at the same time, what about Haiti? What about Trinidad? What about, you know, Venezuela? What about Martinique? And so I had the privilege of like learning a bit of those things. And that just the hunger for knowing more um, and the decentering of Black American as the Amer the think about, first of all, you decenter the United States and then you think about the Americas, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's also a violent thing that was done, but, you know, the Americas, right? Um, and then you look at the, was it like 11.5 million people that came through and like a fraction of that came to the United States, a fraction. A there are more black fraction, people. Yeah. Exactly. It's like there, it, we were hundreds of thousands. The rest of the mm -hmm. millions are scattered around the Americas, mm -hmm. right? Or, you know, and, you know, we're worked to death in chattel slavery, but the numbers mm -hmm. are, are higher outside of the United States and in. So the hunger to know more. And then learning, like, for instance, like, we were talking about Black portraitures, which is coming up. I sat on a panel 10 years ago, probably now, and um, Nandeep Ntambo, an amazing artist, uh, we got to a question, I believe she said it on camera, but we definitely had the conversation before. And it was like, again, with humility, it's like, do you identify as Black? And she's like, I don't need to. I'm, I'm from South Africa. I am who I am. I'm like, and then I was like, whoa, oh, y'all don't have to think about being Black. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> what must it be like to live like that yeah. where you don't think about what it means to be black? You don't walk into a room every day and count how many there mm -hmm. are. And if you do, it's temporary because you go home and it's always, mm -hmm. and you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So how it is to be, to inhabit a black body is different from country to country. And that came to be fascinating for me. Yeah. I, I, it's, it's, man, there's so many things I want to talk about. I'm just trying to like keep the conversation flowing. But um yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, you know that I've I've heard from a number of uh, a number of uh, uh, you know uh, African people from the continent who immigrate to the United States or who find themselves here who that like that's their culture shock. It's that oh, oh shit, I'm black. You know what I mean? Like, um, and then having to reconcile with what what that means. Um, but at the same time, it's also interesting to me to think about the ways in which. Um, you know, what I refer to as like African cultural retentions, right? Like continue to uh, animate and, and uh, uh, be evidenced um, in black bodies, even when they are separated or cut off from that history, from that culture, from that narrative, right? Um, uh, and, and so what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to get at is like the ways that uh, your body, right, has held on to you know, certain ideas, certain memories, right, which I think becomes evidence in the work that you create, the work that you produce, right, uh, in the stories that you're attempting to tell. Uh, and so uh, I guess just generally, like, what are your, what are your thoughts about that, about the way, ways in which those kinds of uh, uh, performances, aspects of being continue to animate who we are, even beyond the language, like the, the nomenclature, beyond Black, beyond Ghanaian, beyond Iwe, whatever you want to, you know, categorize yourself as, I think there's an expression, right, of, of Blackness that is common amongst us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that something, and I can't speak for anyone other than myself, but a sense that I'm getting is that, is that um, to inhabit again so like we we're skin sacks right we happen to live in a skin sack that we live in right some of our skin sacks are evidently black and to know what it's like to inhabit a black body in the in the era of this as they say in the uh, afrofuturism exhibition at the smithsonian museum of african history and culture that race is science fiction Race is science fiction. So some of us are living in a body that has to experience what it means to be in this body in this era. Some of us don't, right? 
And those of us who don't are still sometimes pulling through because we have our like, there's something in us that still comes through, right? And so I, I guess like, like I'm very proud um, of even with, with regardless of what we've been through, um, I'm proud of our resilience, mm -hmm. right? And so regardless of what your skin sack looks like, if you have proximity to it, there's something that kind of like, like, like is knocking constantly, mm -hmm. you know? And even if you are in the body that gets pressed down, it's still knocking. Right. It's like, it's we're here, yeah. we're here, you know? Um, someone said, yeah, like, you know, it's like there's, we know we are our ancestors wild dreams right but also we we will be someone's ancestor someday right um they're knocking constantly you know they're lifting us up they're keeping us through they're saying hey remember me you know um so like that's the thing that i cling to right and then the other thing that i cling to is um you know um black history with it, uh, the history of what happened is everyone's history. It's a global history, right? Um, it's a, it's a, the original sin of enslavement, right? The ones that existed prior to the transatlantic slave trade um, and the ones that are still existing now. It is a mortal sin, right? That unfortunately is still amongst us, among us. And, but as a community of humans, there are lots of things we have to deal with what we did with the indigenous populations everywhere that we kicked them out, right? In, wherever it's, it's popping up, it has to be dealt with for us as a human community to be able to heal. And that's like, I'm speaking from my own perspective in terms of my own proximity to that type of violence. But wherever it pops up, we have to address it because again, if they come for us today, they'll come for you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, I gotta sit with that one for a second. <laughs> um, I'm thinking now. Uh, also, well, this this question is you know somewhat related, but but uh, kind of moving moving us uh, forward a little bit. You, you you said this a little bit earlier, and I. I I wrote it down because I wanted to ask you to uh, expound on this. But you talked about in your work uh, and in your, uh, both in your um, uh, educational pursuits, but also in your creative practice pursuits, this idea of expanding the map of Blacks. Uh, can you talk a little bit? Can you explain, expound on that a little bit more? Well, yeah. I mean, I just think that, like, it took a lot to, I don't know, I mean, Thankfully, we have generations of kids that hopefully don't are not experiencing what some of us and maybe our parents experienced, where we were ashamed of being black, right? Like it was death, disaster. So you know, I grew up with National Geographic, that rack of yellow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was like Encyclopedia Britannica and National Geographic. You know, it was like if you were middle class or aspirational in any kind of way, it didn't even matter. Like, like. A lot of us know about that rack of National Geographic, right? There are lots of ways to look at that, right? And if, if you're looking at it from the perspective of a young Black girl in the 1980s, you're like amazed by all of the, the beautiful kind of um, rural places that are being depicted. But then at the same time, there's something that's also happening on TV, which is like dollar a day to save an African child. And you're like somehow just, and then there's like the bare breastedness that we're being taught is like a sexualized mm -hmm. thing, which is completely out of context, right? And so it was like this kind of like, like, how do I relate with this content? How do I relate with this continent? What does it mean? And then your preacher is telling you like, thank God we were saved from, mm -hmm. from we could be in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> as if that's like the pit of hell right, right, right. <laughs> you and, know what i mean now, and now we all want to go back so all this cognitive exactly it was like this cognitive dissonance you know what i mean and like you know and so growing up with that cognitive dissonance with regard to the continent was traumatic right and i and then i got my family because we're pan-africanists 
they're trying to disrupt that, you know, but the TV is telling me mm-hmm. something else. The newspapers, you've got um, Kevin Carter, you know, who waited for like how many hours to see the Falcon, like the vulture, like pounce on that child. Mm-hmm. You know, this photograph. Mm-hmm. So there's like the, uh, one of the Bang Bang Club members from South Africa. Um, and rest his soul in peace as well, because photographers were, I, I understand a little bit what he was doing, but like at some point your humanity has to trump mm-hmm. things. I think he learned that the hard way. Um, but like apparently, you know this photo of the Sudanese child that's like kind of curled up on the floor. And then there's a, is it a vulture? I think it's a vulture that's sitting in the back. And it was all over every newspaper. And it was, the good thing is that it was to highlight, I think it was a, um, a drought in Sudan. Mm-hmm. Or in East Africa, I'll say, I'm sure it was that. And so that photograph was like, it went went viral. As it, back in the day, that would meant it was in all the newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then when he got in, when he was interviewed, this is all documented. When he was interviewed, proudly he said, "Yeah, I waited for like I don't know an hour. I just wanted to see the vulture van and things." And I was, and everyone was like, the the community again. This is the beginning of. I, I feel like it might. Well, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> they were like, wait a minute. So you chose photograph over the life of that child? Uh, uh, like, we're like, dude, bruh. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not a thing, you know? But at the same time, as a photographer, I look at what he did and I'm like, I understand because I think for him as well, I just, I mean, I want to give him some grace. It's like, how do you take the image that's going to hit to the heart of the people to say this is happening look what is happening in this part of the world right but at the same time anyways what it also did it just made africa the entire continent look like death disaster disease destruction diplomacy and depravity so how do i live in a black body when i know where my so where i know where my body's from right so you know i don't know first grade you know, we're studying like the countries and the continents. Like, Giselle, where are you from, Greece? Oh, Laura, where are you from? I think my parents came here from Germany. So and so, where are you from? And then, like, where am I from? Africa. Slaves. And mm-hmm. then, then, like, the trauma, the, the, right. the every February right. thing. Right. So, expanding the mega blackness was about um, finding some agency and some dignity in what it meant to be in this body. And, and, and to know that we have multiple stories and not just the one that we're told in school. That's what's up. Y- y'all can clap for that. Yeah. Um, we're all doing the work, though. Right? <laughs> I'm literally <laughs> preaching to the choir, but yeah. I do appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I, I want to uh, jump a little bit to talk also about uh, the still residency. Um, yeah, uh, so the Still Residency is a, a residency program that you started in uh, South Africa, in Johannesburg. Um, and this is a residency program geared towards uh, empowering emerging artists uh, from the uh, Johannesburg community uh, by giving them opportunities and resources. But uh, when we were talking last night, you spoke a little bit about the ways that, or the ways in which a uh, residency program kind of opened up for you a realm of possibility as an artist. So can you? share a little bit about your vision for still and and maybe that story that you were telling us last night yeah um so i'm 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 telling you a bit of my story but like actually most black americans that survived the transatlantic slave trade we all have that how to get free story i just happen to know the names of the people that helped us get free um so my grandmother, my paternal grandmother is a descendant of William Still. William Still was, if you were to think Harriet Tubman, mm-hmm. like brothers and sisters in arms, mm-hmm. right? So um, the Grand Railroad was a, a series of safe houses. Um, and so William Still went back several times as well. So he escaped, he escaped and then he and his brother, um, uh, there's a book called The Underground Railroad uh, written by him. And, um, and he talks about going back and forth, right? And so I decided to, also I felt like there was a lot of attention to my grandfather um, who has another story, but I'm like, what about his wife though, right? Like she's a bad, she's bad too, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like the two families came together, you know, you got Garvey, you've got Garvey on one side and you've got still on the other side, the still Arthur family. So I wanted to do something to honor her. Um, So still is, that's why it's called that, but also, 
you know, in keeping with that idea, you know, I started doing residencies in Paris at Cité Internationale des Arts, Cité Internationale des Arts, Cité des Arts in um, Paris. And that was the first time I got space to really breathe and like just play and think about my practice, um, expand my practice, do things that I didn't worry about whether or not it was going to land in a gallery, right? Like it's just like a, a place to play. Mm -hmm. um, and so I almost kind of think of residencies also like safe houses, mm -hmm. you know what mm -hmm. I mean? So that's the reason it's called that. Um, we support SEDEC region. Uh, so we have a few um, primary missions. The first is Southern African development countries. So to the degree that we can, we try to choose artists that come from Southern Africa. I'm loving what's happening in West Africa, mm -hmm. um, whether it's the Anglophone areas or the Francophone areas. There's a lot of support in West Africa, Ghana, Senegal. Um, you know, the French cultural, the, the cultural community is doing a lot, right, in France, mm -hmm. British. But like South Africa is another kind of, Southern Africa is another situation. And so I wanted to be able to um, care for that community because Johannesburg is the center of the art world in that part of the region of Africa. So what does it mean to be able to get from Angola, right? Or or, or think or even Bintook, like, you know, Namibia is right there. Like, who's who's checking this? And there's somebody for sure, but like, you know, with the closeness to Johannesburg, where you have the Johannesburg Art Gallery, you have the Cape Town Art, sorry, you have the Johannesburg Art Fair, you have the Cape Town Art Fair. People fly from all over the world to see artists there. So I want to help to get that community to be able to have, and even like as close as Soe to. Mm -hmm. So really the, the, the place was in, um, inspired by an amazing artist from Zita Camille, who I mentor. And like, just for her to get from Soe to, to Johannesburg, I had to learn things, mm -hmm. right? And, 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 you know, that you have to kind of like be intentional about how to like help people you can't just say, oh, it's right there. It's like, oh, I live in Newark and Chelsea's right there. Right. But like for some people getting from Newark to Chelsea is still a track. You know what I mean? So that's part of, that's the first care that, um, you know, that I, we, that the first community that we want to care for are, are Southern African development countries, um, uh, primary caregivers, okay. right? So there are women who, we lose a lot of women artists to, we, we, we retain a lot, but we also can, some primary caregiving women and men, but many of them are women, have a hard time getting back to their practice. Um, and that's not just having children. It's also, it could be like caring for a parent, mm -hmm. right? So it's like you, you have to stop your whole world for five years and get your brain back and get yourself back. And the gallery is like, yeah, we want it. Like, what's the show? And you're like, but dude, where am I going to make it? Like, <laughs> right. where's the money? Right. <laughs> You know, so we want to, um, we create space for uh, primary caregivers and whether that means your child comes with you to the studio or we try to find a way for you to get childcare or, or something to, to help them get back into their practice. Um, queer community, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so we provide a stipend. Um, we provide um, uh, an honorarium. So you can like whatever bills you got to pay before you get there, we got you. I mean, to the degree that we can, and <laughs> we got all of them. <laughs> we, 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 we can put we can put a little a little like <laughs> on whatever bills you came in with, um, which is the purpose. And saying that because those were the things that I needed, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I did a residency once where the honorarium came like two weeks after I left, so I was there like nothing but like. I'll just say bread and butter, <laughs> you know, for like the whole time. <laughs> That's terrible. Um, because there are blind spots. Yeah, yeah. I think that the philanthropic community with regards to the arts is strong and we need them, but there are blind spots. Mm -hmm. And some of us are in the blind spot, which is why so many artists that are able to make it already have mm -hmm. some level of support or patronage. Mm -hmm. Residencies are a form of patronage. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there are, there are pitfalls and blind spots that they don't remember. Another thing that is important to us is that many, some can be an extraction model. So what we try to do, our intention um, or our mandate, at least the mandate that I'm giving our board and our artistic director, is that um, we do not require them to give us work in the end. We don't require them to actually do anything because sometimes you just need to sit yeah. and think, right? We also have a second space that um, is a little bit more internationally focused, um, but not 
uh, you know, but it's for thinkers. So, so I have, I'm, I have given my former live workspace over to thinkers. Um, it's just because it's set up as a living room and a bedroom and all this kind of stuff. And then adjacent to that, we have 7,000 square feet. So 3,000 square feet for thinkers and 3,000 square feet for the artists. We support up to eight artists a year. And, um, and in that space, they can just there's and makers and non make mark makers and non mark makers. Okay. Um, but yeah, basically the thing was that yeah. So that's, I mean, I don't feel like I need to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> There's a website. We have an artistic, an amazing artistic director, Siwan Goboza. I'm from South Africa, curator, artist, um, activist. Um, so he's at our helm. We have an amazing board of directors collectors we're also nurturing co collectors oh that's what i was going to say is that they what we do is our intention is that when the artist comes out um we'll take they when they have um we have a benefit prints right so they're allowed to make them out. they're invited to make they don't have to and a benefit print of which um 70 percent of the proceeds of their prints mm -hmm. Um, go to them. Okay. And the reason for that is a to put money into their pocket, and b and sometimes we buy them, but like we don't we don't take them. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, the benefit is that immediately from the first sale, their economy is affected, but also their place in collections. Mm -hmm. And that's that's like something that a lot, some of the artists really need. Right to build up that. That cash. Yeah. Their mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Um, so I know we have uh, maybe about 10 minutes left. I, I wanted to open it up uh, to see if anyone in our audience had any questions for Ayala. See, I ran my mouth. So. <laughs> see, that's why you need community. <laughs> Like, I'll put a pin in this. Somebody <laughs> remind me later. Thank you, Donovan. I appreciate that. Um, so um, the the movement for me, so there's two parts to the movement. Um, um, I started to, so something that happened in, um, if I were to put a very unfortunate bookmarks, set of bookmarks on the process, there's Trayvon Martin and then there's um, George Floyd, right? Um, I was working on, there's a, there's a work that's called Death, um, which is a lynching image. Um, and Trayvon happened around the time that I was making, like I had just, I had made it just before, but it was hanging in my studio when Trayvon um, was murdered. Um, and then, but I was in Paris. I was talking with someone last night as well at our lovely board member, Alicia Felder's home, um, about, you know, I'm, I, I have a level of shame associated with not being here to lend my body to the protests and to really, like, you know, be in the numbers and the masses, right? I mean, I was able to, to I, I attended the Millions March in New York, but, like, you know, I was very detached from what was happening here. George Floyd happened. I was um, in Tobago and I was uh, working the underwater um, um, journey of the deep sea, journey of the deep sea dweller who among us had killed an albatross. Um, and you'll see when you have a chance, whoever gets a chance to see the exhibition, um, there's a moment where I'm like the the character I'm performing because it's like I can't breathe, and so in my in my um, interpretation, I I feel like Drexia is also protesting from the from beneath. So they know what's happening with their cousins on the surface, right? And so they're protesting with us, right? Um, and so like for me, and then. Um, I also have a work that um, a big moment in my career was when I got collected into the um, Studio Museum of Harlem. Hey. Hey. I knew I knew some, I knew somebody was watching <laughs> <laughs> when Thelma call, came calling. Um, but um, there's the piece that they have in their collection is called "Wild as the Wind," um, where um, 
and that happened around one of I'm not I'm, it might have been Flood Nicholas Castile um, when one of the grand juries came out and I was just like dude I'm off Facebook now I'm in Paris I'm out of the world I'm out I'm away but I'm getting these missives right and I'm like this is fucking great excuse me like, um it's it, this is insane right and so that day I had I happened to be um, one of the grand juries came down. And I happened to be, I had a whole plan. I shoot over in the course of like a week. I plan for like two years, but it takes me like a week to, to like um, make the work. Um, and so that one of those came down, one of the grand juries where they were con considered innocent or whatever came down. And I was like, dude, I can't just sit here and pose. I need to move my body. Like I'm feeling petrified and I, like, I, like, I feel like I'm going to be petrified. So there's a work that's called To Kill or Allowed to Live. Um, and the title came from a book, uh, an essay by Sheila Bembe called Necropolitics. Um, and, and it has to do with sovereignty, right? A nation is sovereign. A nation state can be considered sovereign when it has the power to decide to kill or allow to live. Hectic. Like, who the hell is going to give you the power to kill? Like, what does that mean, right? Anyway, that's a pin for another day. But like, and so I made a, a work called To Kill or Allowed to Live. And it was just like, I just needed my body to move. And in the same day, I made Wild as the Wind. So the way, and then of course, I'm thinking the story of photography, history of photography, Moybridge and, and, um, and you know, uh, Murray, you know, but like, I, I just, I needed to move. I needed to kind of like shake that load off. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't, there was no way I could like, cause you're, you're posing and you're thinking you know, and I'm just like, they fucking, they, they let them off? Like, are you kidding me? So I just, the only way to kind of get that, you know, is to move. So that's when movement, um, and so motion kind of came into the work. Okay. Okay. With the animation, um, it was, um, you know, wanting, thinking a lot about co-viewing, right? Parents, like, so it's also how do you, meet people where they are, right? And animation, obviously, there are many adults that engage with animation. Um, my partners, Velaki and Bado, and I, you know, when we met, um, we, you know, he had a whole universe of working with animation. And I kind of hadn't really thought about it in many years. Um, somehow, excuse me, I thought it was, I, I infantilized it, which was an error on my, on my part. Um, so he helped to kind of bring that language that aesthetic that point of um entry to my purview um so we worked um he does computer generated imaging uh powered by or driven by motion capture okay. so i got to like put on the suit and yeah. like move around and it was really fun well yeah i mean i think it, it certainly adds another like dimension to the work as well you know what i mean especially because a lot of the pieces that you're making like the one i'm looking at on the cover of the uh, uh, bill here is, you know, very reminiscent of a gong gong. Uh, and, you know, a gong gong is not alive until it's actually moving. You know what I mean? Like, right. it's supposed to be animated, right? So I think, you know, seeing your, seeing your bodies in motion, right? Like, whether it's in motion in the still images, right? Like, the movements, the poses, or in motion via the animations, I think, adds a level of engagement to the Absolutely. And something that Zueli and I talked quite a bit about was like when I was making the Agungun work, and shout out to Rama Jao, um, Wan, Wan, Wan Biwasaki, um, uh, Robert Young of the Cloth Cheddar um, from Nigeria. I'm, I'm speaking to my collaborators. Mark Blaze from Zimbabwe, who did the sound installation. Um, Abayam Kalu, who did the scent installation, Sarah um, ba uh, Bar Baron. You know, like this is this exhibition is a series of collaborations, including Karen Melbourne and Iran Tahor and Amaka Tahor. And honestly, I, I should stop because I'll miss someone. But um, <laughs> but like, um, you know, so the, the 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 team that installed that the, the kind of exhibition design is a real thing, like tools, the thing, <laughs> like the entire Smithsonian Museum of African Arts team. A lot of that stuff is happening in the back house, back office. But um, to the, to this point, when, um, so Rama Jao and I from Senegal um, were working on this, and um, but the idea, I mean, feel free to Google a goon goon further so I don't take up too much time, but, um, you know, I imagine that when you say that the goon is only active when moving, I was like, okay, so 
these bodies fell mm -hmm. into the sea. Facts, some of them actually became part of the, the sea floor, mm -hmm. right? Which became part of the water, mm -hmm. which became part of the air mm -hmm. that we breathe, mm -hmm. right? Like our DNA is in, yeah, yeah, yeah. is embedded, yeah. right? As is all, um, but there's a particular thing on that route, right? Um, and then the agungun when it's activated because it carries the ancestors with it in mm -hmm. each of its cells, mm -hmm. each of its like, chips of cloth. Mm -hmm. And when it whirls and it swirls, it like purifies the air and it purifies and it, and it brings whatever is needed. So I was like, what if we had an agungum to work on the seafloor, mm -hmm. right? So Zueli and I kind of uh, spent, he spent a lot of time um, doing the cloth simulation and, and trying to, and he not tried, he did um, create the movement, but it exists as an animation. Mm -hmm. And in the exhibition space, it's an apparition. Mm -hmm. So um, when you have a chance to see the exhibition, when you enter the room where the little portholes are, so the Karen Milborn did an amazing job of like, in thinking about the um, installation, um, giving you a chance to kind of imagine that you're on a ship and you're looking out into the depths, right? And so um, there's a sonic cue um, that's a, the sound of a whale or the sound of um, women singing mm. or people singing, mourners, um, or the sound of thunder or the sound of seagulls, right? That sonic cue happens and then you'll see the, um, the apparitions, which are the anima wow. animations. Wow. That's uh. epic, epic, epic. Uh, I'm gonna ask one last question and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap up. Oh, Unless there's yeah. another question yes. there, yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm, I'm going to ask you to. Uh, I want to make sure I remember that I, the question. Oh, you got it. Okay. Yeah. So the first question is, um, what were the challenges mm -hmm. that I had to overcome in order to continue and thrive on my artistic journey? And the second question is, what were the challenges internally that I had to overcome in order to thrive on my artistic journey? Is that correct? Yeah. And how did I overcome it? Um, the first, the first challenge is like facts, like economic, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was just speaking with um, Lauren or I was speaking with someone um, <laughs> about, you know, like I appreciate that, I appreciate it that people want to buy my work today, but the price point for that work is something. But when I needed them, it was like $3,000. When I needed them, it was $500. Mm -hmm. Right, and so this idea, oh, we were talking about this. The idea is that, you know, I understand, again, like I don't wanna knock any philanthropists, but again, when you think about the blind spots, it's that part where, you know, um, yes, I get proof of concept. They wanna know that they're putting their money into something that's real, right? But we have to remember to care for the people that are still trying to get there. Um, and it took a lot of like, you know, begging from Peter to pay Paul, borrowing from Peter to pay Paul kind of stuff. Um, even as a middle class, I mean, I have to admit, like my economics were not where some people's economics are. You know, I'm not saying I grew up rich, but I didn't grow up, grow up in a situation where I had some of the economic challenges that my peers, that some of my peers have all over the world, right? So if even in my situation, I'm begging, from, borrowing, begging and borrowing from Peter to pay Paul, like in order to get where I am, again, how many people fall through the cracks mm -hmm. with brilliance, mm -hmm. with messages to share. So, um, you know, I say that with humility, but the thing is, it's like, you know, seriously, we like, you know, just hanging on, like eating croissants, you know, and cheese and like riclettes you know, like, and, you know, just trying to have some dignity in my meals <laughs> um, because thousands, because the, this, every time I got a thousand dollars, it was like going into renting a costume or it was going into, you know, paying a printer or it was going into renting a space so I could show my work. I mean, also that's the other thing, like my first shows I had to show, I had to give myself or Ingrid 
curated my show 24th birthday. We did all that. She curated my first show, too. Right? Shout out to Ingrid Lafleur, right? Madame, uh, um, the futurist. Um, that's why she she's in Paris already. She, like, she's <laughs> she like, I'll us, be there when you get there. <laughs> I'll be there when you get there. So that's the first thing was like, the, you know, overcoming, having the confidence to take a risk on myself, right? Because also even the family, I love my family, but they were like, girl, when are you going to law school? Because this is not it, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was the first one. And then internally is something I touched on earlier, which is just like, um, I had to, because I chose this, uh, this, this train of thought, I had to um, find a way, like I'm very grateful to Zoey, um, my partner, because um, you know, for many, you know, I had to give up a lot in terms of my family building. Um, it's just my journey. It's not a big thing. You know what I mean? I could have chosen differently or I could have followed a different train and I'm, and I'm happy sliding doors. You know what I mean? I'm happy with the door that I got in, the, the train that I got on. But like, you know, I realized like I used to have these openings where I had these t- and then like there was no one to hug me. Like I gave it all. I left it all in the gallery and then I'm at home, you know, trying to like deal with all this energy, you know? So um, I decided to tell different stories at a certain point. I was like, okay, let's, let's enough of that, mm-hmm. right? Who are the characters that I wanted to meet? Who are the characters I wish existed? You know, dreaming forward, but also um, making sure that I kept the love that I needed in my life around me so that, like, when I was weak, I had someone to lift me up. You know what I'm saying? And that was really important, especially with this, because this was a big labor, you know? So. Thank you for that. Yes, 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 yes. Do all of that, all of that, yeah. Uh, the, the, do we have any other questions for the audience? Uh, the last thing that I wanted to just ask you to touch on, and this is something that you kind of alluded to uh, in, the, in the previous response, uh, when you mentioned your collaborators with this exhibition. Uh, something that has come up in several of our uh, Adama salons is, uh, you know, this this question around uh, reauthoring what, how reauthoring the way we uh, evaluate and value uh, black art, right? Like, you know, in thinking about this idea of collaboration, this idea of community, right, which is central in a lot of African philosophies. I just wanted to maybe ask you to speak a little bit about what that means, right? Like I know, for example, in South Africa, you have the, you have Ubuntu, right? Like I am because we are, right? You know, it's uh, uh, this idea that nothing that we create comes out of a, a vacuum, right? We're all a part of a community. Um, I wanted to maybe ask you to just talk a little bit about your, like what you think or how you feel, um, you know, how you feel about uh, this, this, uh, uh, very, very um, uh, potent and, and sudden almost in many cases, like interest in black art, which is, you know, in many ways sort of isolating people and isolating communities, right? Like uh, so that the value can be extracted out of it. But there's a, obviously in your practice and in a lot of other artists' practices, right? We see a lot of artists building residencies and trying to give back to their communities. But I just wanted to maybe ask you to, to talk a little bit about what community uh, means to you as an artist of, African, uh, of the African diaspora? Yeah, um, I guess since this is probably going to be the last, um, I want to thank you, Fahal and Adama, um, because that's what we do. Mm-hmm. That's our mandate, right? Like Adama is um, is 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 an extension of the legacy, but it's also um, a response to the mandate, mm-hmm. you know, um, we need to, um, we, we, we don't need to, we have always been supporting each other. Mm-hmm. That's what it meant to survive. It, and this is when I circle in on the, the Americas mm-hmm. and the transatlantic slave trade survivors. And even your family, like the still family and their, the work that they did. Absolutely. Yeah. Like that's the mandate. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, do you know what it meant to get through that? Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, like, the, the 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 rate of the like 
if to get to the age of like 25 was like already a thing, mm -hmm. you know, sun up to sundown like that, right? So to actually be able to do and so um so man and I felt I feel it implicitly. And so like the work that you're doing, um, the work that I'm doing, the work that the Astro Gate is mm -hmm. doing Gates is doing, Derek Adams, mm -hmm. um in Connecticut, um uh who's in Connecticut? Titus Titus Kafar, Kafar, um Zaneli Maholi, mm -hmm. Ida Moulinet, mm -hmm. uh, Vishwa Bandu mm -hmm. in, Cong in Congo. Um, I'm going to miss some names, but like, you know, artist led spaces um, are really a part of that underground railroad mm -hmm. mentality, mm -hmm. right? And I think that that's um, something that is, for some of us, comes naturally, right? And so, because we know we need it. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot the first part of the question, though. That, no, you're, you're, you're on it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so like, you know, so to me, I think that, um, you know, because we see far, mm -hmm. right? Because we came from far. Mm -hmm. We came from far away mm -hmm. to get to us. I mean, it's not easy. Even to get to the film, we'll see you at the museum, not us <laughs> taking care of ourselves, <laughs> right? right? right. Um, you know, uh, but anyways, I guess, you know, so, and then, you know, the world sees us, right? So we've done the job of we we help to make each other visible regularly, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's part of it. But like on the side of um, you know this uh, beautiful celebration of art of, of 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 creativity made from Africa and the diaspora um, is you know I, I'm with Marianne Ibrahim where I resist and and with Simone and Jami where I resist the idea that it's a trend. Mm -hmm. No, it's not a trend. Yeah, yeah. First of all, African art has always been contemporary, mm -hmm. even when you called it traditional. Right, right. You know, there's something to, I mean, when I was working on this project, I was looking at these Kumba textiles from the Congo, the King Kong Kingdom, Congo Kingdom. And um, I was at the home of some collectors, um, the Polk family. And like, you know, I looked at a piece that, you know, the first stitching is like a century uh, older than the last stitching. Wow. You know what I mean? Like this, and uh, you know, Karaati talks about this, like the repair mm -hmm. and the constant repair. Mm -hmm. Like these are living objects, mm -hmm. right? And so contemporary African art, um, it is, it's, it's, I appreciate the, the institutions right now that are, that are making uh, the effort, the High Museum, you know, um, Smithsonian mm -hmm. Museum of African Art just returned a bunch of Benin bronzes. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum just hired Ernestine, an amazing curator. I appreciate that. The institutions are correcting mm -hmm. their approach um, to their collections, um, and this is happening for because it's time to happen. I mean, I think it will continue to happen because you know, first of all, creativity is a living thing. Mm -hmm. People always create, so it's not so much um, a moment in time as much as it's um, it's a time. It's it's like it's like a. Uh, it's 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 a it's not a reckoning so much, but it's like a, you know, it's just it's like a breakthrough. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a breakthrough that's going to keep doing what it's been doing. Um, a blockage has been cracked in the, the ceiling. Mm -hmm. You know, eventually, if 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 you have a crack in the the, the waters will come right. in. It's it'll, a shift. It'll, it's a shift. Yeah. And and once it's once that's broken, you know, it's it is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Marianne and, and Pierre uh, of Marianne Ibrahim Gallery like to say that the, you know, I don't know if they, it's not a, they didn't found it, but like in terms of the mission, the tide rises all ships, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? So that's what's happening with contemporary, uh, with, with, the, with this sudden um, kind of like, you know, just like, um, what is, what's the word? Like jubilation. Fervor. Yeah, around black creativity, wherever it exists. Um, it's just the beginning, you know, and it's a good thing. It's a really, really good thing. It unlocked so many doors. Um, I like to say that photography um, you know, um, was created a shift in terms of making things far closer, mm -hmm. faster, mm -hmm. as is the internet, mm -hmm. as is social media, as is you know, so you also, there's a democratiz democratization of access to imagery. Mm -hmm. um, folks are selling artwork on their phones, yep. bruh. Like, 
no shade to the middleman, mm-hmm. the gallery, but it's not really necessary right, right. these days. And that's 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 like that creates economic power. And that's at the end of the day what our artists need in, uh, in order to thrive, in order to be seen, in order to get their messages heard. And so, like, we love your space, Anima, this space, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Yards. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's it's just a, a, it's a it's a stop on that journey. It's like a facilitator of that really important um, important um, activism, right? It's a contribution to society. And going back to what I said before, until we until we heal, there's no healing. There it is. I would drop this mic, but it ain't mine. I don't want to break it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that. Um, Yes, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and yes, uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for your continued support for Adamo. The We Need Love exhibition is open. We encourage you to go and check it out. Uh, this is our first exhibition for Adama. Uh, there'll be many, many more to come. Uh, Ayana's exhibition uh, from the deep will be on view at the Smithsonian through April 2024. So you, you, there ain't no excuses for you not to get there. <laughs> Excuse me, you not get there. Uh, thank you, Ayana. Uh, we look forward to it. And please let us know how uh, people can follow you and, and even support the still residency. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, and also, I want to thank board member Alicia Felder for like really like doing the work to make sure I got on the seat right now today. Um, uh, so, st- yes. Yeah, so, um, Ayana V. Jackson is my um, Instagram. So, my name. And, um, and then um, at Still Artist Residency is our um, Instagram for Still. Our website is also stillartistresidency.org. Um, bear with us. We are building the plane while flying. So um, there's we, still... We know that struggle. <laughs> <laughs> there's still tweaks to the website, but we are there. Um, and then in the event that um, you're interested in supporting us um, as, we try, as we are uh, beginning to bring in our, our first official cohort um, in September, um, we've made uh, benefits print, benefit prints available. So um, I have four works that uh, are sketches of from, from me uh, that, um, that are being made available. They're $1,000. Um, and I'll, and the note on the thousand dollar note note is that I, I heard tax deductible. Uh, we are five hundred one c three. It is tax deductible. But I the the thing I want to say about the thousand dollars is that something that's important to us as well is cultivating patronage, mm-hmm. right? Um, and collecting, right? Um, you you know you got to start somewhere, right? And so um, I think that that price point is a is a is a is a reasonable entry point. Um, we do allow it to be in like an installment or two, up to three. Um, but it's also about, and so that's how we're. That's part of how we're funding. We're actually looking for an angel investor to help us to get our endowment. But uh, so actually, if anyone's listening <laughs> um, <laughs> and wants to uh, help us with our endowment, but for now we're just raising money so that we can um, support the artists and keep our roof over our head. Um, and then we also have Pumse de Canile does have a beautiful print. Um, that um, there are editions of 12. And yeah, it's just how we're trying to kind of, we're, we're fundraising. Um, and then we have our gala that will be happening uh, September 6th. Um, Siwa Goboza, our artistic director, is very hard at work. We're putting together a beautiful, like, iconic week long um, between the Johannesburg Art Fair events, studio visits, um, our actual gala. We'll have a group show of the artists that we've had so far. Um, so, uh, that's how you get involved. So, still artistresidency.org and Ayana V. Jackson. And then, with regard to uh, my individual practice, um, I you can find um, anything you need to know with Marianne Ibrahim Gallery. Um, so, and then, of course, uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art. Um, what are the, what's their handle? S I no, I'm sorry, the Instagram. At Smithsonian under, underscore, at Smithsonian underscore African Art, um, and yes, from the deep in the wake of Drexia will be on view. And um, please remember, if you're tagging anything related, remember to tag Drexia. These two men truthfully did lay it on the line. Um, I'm not the only art artist. Farley Baez, 
um, you know, uh, Ellen Gallagher. There, there are countless artists that have worked with this, this narrative. But let's remember that um, it is the brainchild of Detroit, last thing to say. And also, like, you know, techno is black music. Don't forget that. Um, and so, yeah, so just remember to tag Drexia as well, because um, we, I would not be here were it not for them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you all being here. Thank you to our audience on the line as well. Uh, please check out the exhibition and drink up that wine and eat them cupcakes. Uh, thank you all for being here.